Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, I'm sure all of you have started on Deliverable 5, right? Any questions? So far, so good. Last uh, library we're installing, NumPy, no more installation issues. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's focus on uh, lecture material today. We are going to finish up our second theme of the course on interactive system design. We've talked quite a bit over the last couple weeks about what an information system is, uh, how to go about designing it. We've focused on visual design. We've talked a little bit now about the actual process itself. And we ended last time in Lecture 8 by putting user testing at the center of our design process, right? Testing things with our users often, as often and as early uh, as possible. Just as a reminder, uh, you're working your way through these 10 deliverables, and in the last three weeks, you're going to be developing your final project, which is turning this system into an educational, a piece of educational software. And during those three weeks, you're going to do a fair bit of user testing. And you're going to be reporting on that user testing when you present your final project during the oral, uh, oral uh, during the exam period. During that oral presentation, you're going to be presenting results from your user testing. And the thing we're going to be looking for are metrics, quantitative data. If you tell us that you tested this on three of your friends and they thought it was cool and they liked it and they learned ASL, that ain't going to cut it, right? We're looking for metrics. It'll be up to you to decide what metrics, to collect the metrics and what the metrics mean about which aspects of your system are usable, accessible, uh, have high utility, uh, and so on. Okay, so just remember that from lecture seven, uh, seven and eight. What really distinguishes the design process for HCI is a focus on user testing and turning user testing into a quantitative exercise. Okay, we're going to end today by talking about uh, information spaces and user interfaces, which is a, a view onto that information space when you design. Uh, an interface, you're designing a particular way to view parts of an information space. The internet is an information space. A browser is a user interface onto that information space. Lots of different ways of viewing different parts of the internet depending on the context, the person, the activity, and so on. Okay, so that'll conclude uh, theme number two, and then we will move on to the third theme of the course, which is made up of a series of four lectures on us. So we're going to do uh, we're going to do psychology in just four lectures. Um, we're pretty complicated, so obviously this is going to be a very uh, a very surface treatment of various aspects of human psychology that have to do with HCI. And like we've done many times before, we're going to as we work our way through these four lectures. There is a gradient going from things that are more objective to things that are increasingly subjective. Sometimes we go the other way around, but I tried to organize this into in lecture 10, which will probably make uh, quite a dent in today. We're going to focus on mental models. The brain is a predictive machine. As you interact with the world around you or technology, your brain starts to build up a mental model, and it uses that mental model to make predictions about what happens when you push against the world. What is going to be the sensory repercussion of that action? You remember in the first week of the course, we talked about John Dewey. Action is primary, right? We wave our hand over a leap motion device. We act first, and we observe what comes back. After doing that a few times, we do a new action, and our mental model of this weird thing called leap motion makes a prediction about what we're going to see on the screen, the sensory repercussion of our action. This is going to be a relatively objective aspect of our psychology that we're going to look at today. And next week, we're going to get into more and more subjective aspects of human cognition, all the way up to affect or emotion. I'm sure you've all been frustrated with your computers. You've all had a satisfying experience with a new app. Those are affects, right? The emotional components of interaction. We'll focus on that in lecture uh, 13. Okay, so that's where we are and where we're going. So we finished lecture eight uh, last time. Let's move on to lecture uh, nine now on information spaces. And we just started this a little bit last time. Um, remember, an information space is some underlying conceptual structure. And then we have a user interface, which provides a view onto that space. 
We'll start today with sort of very familiar user interfaces and move into a more exotic kinds of interfaces. So uh, the most mundane user interface you can imagine is the command line. So long before uh, Windows was invented and even Linux, there was a blinking cursor and a prompt, right? You typed stuff in. The simplest possible way to interact with the computer, everything is text-based, and the exchange medium is the computer. What do we mean by the exchange medium? It's the thing through which the human gives commands to the computer and vice versa. So the exchange medium might be a keyboard, and then in the 60s and 70s, this thing called a mouse was invented, and now we have touch screens and all sorts of other kinds of exchange media. Okay, GUIs, uh, again, are pretty familiar to all of us. They're made up of very, very familiar parts these days, windows, icons, menus, uh, and pointers, lots of different examples of that. And we'll talk a little bit about GUIs in a moment. The different aspects of a GUI help with different ways of interacting with, with the system. So a window provides a two-dimensional window onto something, right? Menus are hierarchically organized. When we were discussing design over the last few weeks, we talked about the importance uh, of hierarchy. So if you want to try and organize structure in a hierarchy or organize an interaction with your user in a hierarchical manner, a menu is an obvious way to go. Widgets and icons, these are sort of localized, context-sensitive interactive components. We'll talk about that in a moment. More and more, in recent years, we're starting to see more tangible interfaces where the exchange medium becomes not so much the computer, but an actual physical object. You're a little bit more aware of manipulating uh, physical objects, which provides this medium of exchange. So that's sort of this third category of tangible interfaces. And just as a fun example of a tangible interface, we're gonna watch a short video now of the React table. In this video, you're gonna see that it is clearly a tangible interface. There's no keyboard, there's no mouse, um, there's no touch screen. Instead, the, uh, the user is gonna manipulate a number of physical objects. So those objects become the exchange medium, the physical environment made up of these objects. As you'll see in a moment, uh, the React table is, much, is not just graphical, but also auditory. We've talked, a lot about, uh, we've talked a lot about visual metaphors. One of the things I want you to pay attention to when we watch the demo of the React table are auditory metaphors. Okay, so watch this video, and like what we did when we watched the Rossling video, I want you to note down all of the different ways in which the system exploits visual and auditory metaphors, and how the objects are manipulated to send commands to, to the computer, to the system. Thank you. 
Okay, I don't know about you, I'm not a huge fan of electronic music and electronic music at 8.30 in the morning. I'm not 100% sure, but there you go. All right, if you weren't awake before, maybe you are, you are now. Okay, that's the React table. Again, you may, uh, it may be appealing to you, it may not, but it has clearly a lot of visual and auditory metaphors. What are some of those metaphors? Twisting the components like dials. Twisting the components like dials, right? So back in the Stone Age, if you had a stereo system, there was this thing on it called a knob, and you would twist it. Remember our discussion about left and right? What do you think clockwise and counterclockwise does in the system? If you're watching carefully, you can probably figure it out, but you can also intuit it if they were following that auditory metaphor all the way. Changes frequency or volume. Frequent changes frequency or volume. Which way is which way? Left would be down and right would be up. That sounds, that sounds right, or whatever it is, right? You can sort of feel it through motor memory. Once you see that and you, there's another widget, you could probably figure it out the first time you interact with it. <laughs> Remember our discussion last time about affordances, right? Aha, uh -huh. there are knobs in this system that you can turn and they turn up the volume or turn up frequency, right? Clockwise tends to mean up or more, counterclockwise less or down. What other metaphors existed in this system? A squiggly line means vibration. A squiggly line means vibration, or more generally, sound, right? It's showing you a waveform of the sound itself. It seems like the longer the line was to the center, the longer the sound was playing. The longer the line from the center, the longer the sound was playing. That might be, I missed that one, but that's, that's possible. What's sort of the underlying metaphor for the whole system? So obviously different blocks kind of do different things. You have this point in the center, right? And then you could place blocks on this interactive table. What's the metaphor there? So you have these lines that are flowing into the center, right? So you have a sink, which is the thing where everything is going to. Right, the drain, if you like, and then a whole bunch of sources or taps, things that are producing things, and they flow in towards the center. Right? And every block that you put on the table becomes a new source and a new part of the sound which is flowing in, which is all combined at the center to produce the sound that you actually hear. Right? What were some of the other metaphors in here? Remember that we're focusing, we're using this as an example of tangible interfaces, so the different ways you can physically manipulate these blocks. Turning them is, is one interaction. Moving them further away from the sink does something else. What else? If you get them closer to each other, they interact with each other. If you get them closer, they interact, right? So somehow these blocks are listening to, to each other, right? There was the example in the middle there of the radar uh, block, where if you turned it, it's radius became larger or smaller, what does that mean? What was the metaphor there? It was like the dial metaphor again. By turning it, you increase the range. You increase the range of what? What was, what was it doing? If you were inside that radius, what happens? If you're inside that radius, then your, your sound was only playing when like, the radar flipped over you. Absolutely, right? So it's basically a metronome, right? So they're using the radar which sweeps around as, uh, as a frequency, right? So something that's triggering whenever you're hit with the radar beam, you do your, your thing, right? So you can set the pace of this, of the sound. What else? There's a whole bunch of them in here. There was a point at which there was a block that was connected to another one, there was a line and they swept through it and it became dashed. What happened? They muted it. They muted it, they cut the sound, right? They cut the feed, they cut the source, right? So that language, cutting the source, is literally what you do in the system, right? A great example of a metaphor. Cut the feed, cut the feed, okay. If you put a block between a block and the sink, what happens? So you have a block and there's a line connecting it to the center, you put a block between the block and the center, what happens? What does it mean? What does that physical interaction or that physical mo movement do? It's interrupting that data. It's interrupting that data somehow, right? So now suddenly the output of the outer block becomes the input to the inner block, 
And it, that inner block somehow modulates or changes the signal coming from the outer block, right? So you have a lot, uh, you have a sound source coming from the outer block and it's being modified by the one in between, right? It's interfering literally or visually with the other block from, in your visual system. And it's also interfering or modulating the sound somehow. Okay, so uh, again, a great example of sort of a different view on an information space. So the information space in this case is a sound source, is a music system, and this user interface provides an interesting kind of view, perhaps one you haven't seen before. So it's interesting to think about how the React table was designed to give a particular view onto this information space. Okay, so let's jump back now to GUIs, for example. We'll go quickly through this because this is obvious to all of us. How many of your virtual desktops look like this? How about your physical desktop? If you've ever come to see me in my office, I'm not that bad, but I'm on my way. Okay, so again, if you think about a GUI, it's obvious, right? There is a, there's a lot of metaphors. Personal computers, when they first appeared in the 80s, the first place they showed up in was offices and then homes. So not surprisingly, most GUIs... Uh, tend to have office metaphors, right? Piles of files and folders uh, and so on. So you can think about the history of where metaphors come from. There have been attempts over the years to go beyond the file and folder uh, set of metaphors. None of them have really caught on. There was a craze about 15 years ago about trying to make 3D desktops in, uh, in Linux. I haven't seen that lately. I think that's kind of died out. Um, it was very fan there used to be fancy interfaces about how to flick between different desktops and so on. Never really seemed to catch on. I think in the interest of time, we'll skip over the video of the bump top video, but you can go and watch that at your leisure. It's kind of an interesting one to watch. Um, they took a traditional GUI with files and folders and added a physics engine. So a physics engine underlies most modern video games today where it simulates Newtonian mechanics or in other words, basic physics, Newtonian physics. So all of the objects now have a 3D <coughs> geometry. They also have a weight, a mass, inertia, friction. So you can, for example, grasp or bunch up a bunch of your files. You can take a hand and spread the files out in a spectrum. You can lasso a bunch of files and stack them up in a vertical stack. You can grab them and throw them against the walls whether they're, they're magnetized and detached. Lots of great eye candy. Whether someone would actually want to use this in practice, I'm not so sure. Okay, so lots of different ways to try and spruce up, which is basically the, the underlying uh, metaphor for GUIs, which is files and folders. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about user interfaces uh, in general. As I mentioned already now, they tend to provide different views on an underlying information system, and different kinds of interfaces embody different ways of thinking. And when we switch to theme number three in a few minutes, cognitive psychology, there are different ways that the human brain tends uh, to work, right? So Windows, visual desktop somehow rely on the human visual sense, right? Of all of our sensory systems, our visual system is the one that we primarily rely on. And not surprisingly, we spend most of our time looking at our screens. Sometimes we're listening to audio, but most of the interaction is visual. It's 2D, we're looking at a two-dimensional uh, plane most of the time. Um, we'll talk later in the course about augmented reality, where you're looking through goggles or glasses, you see the three-dimensional world, and there are virtual artifacts that are added on top of that 3D view. But for most of the time, we're looking at a two-dimensional screen, so Windows provides some sort of view or window onto that space. We mentioned menus already, embody branching and hierarchical organization. Command-based interfaces uh, embody sequential organization. I know some of you started this course with an IDE, and some of you have switched over using the terminal on Mac or even the DOS prompt on Windows, where you're doing everything at the command line. It can be very disconcerting at the beginning if you're not used to working at the command line, but once you get good at it, you can do things very, very quickly because, again, the brain is very good at thinking sequentially. I've got this complex task I want to do. I need to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And as you learn and memorize the commands, you can type them one after the other very quickly. 
Um, you can use piping, where you send a sequence of commands and you say, I don't even want to see the result of this command. Send the output of this command as input to the next uh, command in the, the sequence. And you can start to do very complex things very quickly. Pop-ups are sort of for con contextual information. The user is trying to say, I need some information about this thing at this place at this time uh, here on the desktop or I'm in the middle of this activity. So very specific contextual temporary things that pop up and give us information and disappear, right? In the future, there may be other kinds of parts of user interfaces that are important to us. And if they, if they arise and they stick around, it's because they capture, they help the brain think in a particular way. The brain is good at seeing. The brain is good at recognizing and organizing things hierarchically. We're good about thinking about doing things in sequence. We're good about saying we need information here and now, but once I have it, I want it to go away. Different ways of organizing information in an information space. So let's step back from user interfaces for a moment and talk about information spaces. On the surface, it's kind of an obvious concept. An information space is a bunch of data or objects that are related to one another. What's important to keep in mind is an information space is purely abstract. So I gave you the example of the internet, and then a user interface gives us some sort of view on that space. An information space doesn't have to be purely virtual. Most of our uh, spaces these days, especially our urban spaces, are information spaces, right? You're moving through a physical environment, but there's a lot of information projected around you to help you do whatever you're trying to do in that environment. So uh, transportation hubs are great examples of that, train stations, airports. It may be a space you've never been in before, but you're literally trying to get somewhere. And there is physical information like timetables and signs and objects and help desks <laughs> and personnel to help you get where you're going. And some of it is also electronic. So a good metaphor for an information space is a train station or an airport. You're moving through it. You're trying to do something. And as you move through it, different views of different kinds of information show up to help you uh, on your way. Okay, so an information cell space itself, again, we can think of as these two parts, the underlying conceptual structure, the information structure, and then interfaces uh, onto it. Okay, so we'll continue in, for a couple slides with this metaphor of a train station. You wanna catch a train. What are all the conceptual structures that make up uh, that make up uh, a train station, routes, stations, times, railway classes, and so on. We could have paper timetables. We might have electronic timetables. There may be the big board. You may have an app as you're moving through the train station that also gives you a different view onto stations and timetables. You get on a train, the train starts moving. There's a display in the train of the same route. These are all different views on exactly the same information space. And as the train is moving, or on your app as you're moving, the route itself lights up and changes to show where you are on the route. Right? So often when we're interacting with an information space, we're simultaneously using different user interfaces that provide different views onto that space. Okay. Again, coming back to the idea of hierarchy, if the information space is complex enough, it's usually layered or organized in some hierarchical manner, and at each layer of the system, there are different conceptual structures, right? So again, the internet's a great example, sort of two obvious uh, levels of the hierarchy there. There's the lower level of an individual web page or an individual website, and in an individual web page, you have conceptual structures like text and images and links uh, and so on. And at that level, you have a certain user interface like a web browser or the mobile device format of that, that web page. We move up in the hierarchy and think about the internet as a whole. There are different conceptual structures, which are pages and links between them. So the structure we're thinking about now is a network. And there is a different user interface, which is a search engine, right? We're searching across multiple pages. In the old days, there was actually a global map of the internet, which way back at the beginning looked something like that. It's probably impossible these days to create a picture of the internet. It's too big, too complex, right? So we're relying on user interfaces, which by necessity give us a view on a vanishingly small subset of the overall structure, right? It's just too big these days to view the whole 
the whole thing. So we have different layers of, of organization and different ways of viewing those different levels. Okay. So how do we go about structuring these information spaces? Some of them have existed for a long time, like operating systems with files and folders. Some of them are a little bit more recent, like maybe the Leap Motion system. So often, when you go, if you go and work in HCI, you go and work for a software house, you may be creating not just a new app, but creating an entirely new kind of information system, right? So again, imagine you worked, uh, you worked at Leap Motion when this device was first being created. The uh, developers at that time were performing conceptualization. They were creating an ontology, and we'll take a moment to talk about what an ontology is. I'm going to skip forward one, uh, one slide to disentangle a few big words here. So one of the most fun things you can do as a software developer is be involved in a project where you're creating a new kind of system. So way back at the beginning when GUIs were being invented, someone or some group said, how are we going to provide the user a view onto this operating system, this hard drive with data Let's create an ontology. Let's create two things called files and folders. And we're going to pick those two things because they're obvious metaphors. They match things in the real world, real files and folders. If you look around an office back before there were personal computers, how did people organize things? They put them in files and folders and, fi and drawers and so on. That's where the idea for that particular ontology came from. Deciding on the abstract classes or the things that were going to exist. Okay. Once you create the ontology, once you have the things, then, and you put your system out in the world, people might create their own taxonomy. So given that ontology, they might organize things in different manner. So um, all of us have uh, a laptop these days. We all have an operating system. Regardless of which operating system you have, we're all sharing the same ontology. On all of our laptops, we have files and folders. We all have the same ontology. But we may have different taxonomy. So if you were to look at my hard drive, you would see that at the top level, I organize things in years, 2016, 17, 18. And then inside each of those folders, I have a teaching folder, a research folder, a personal folder, and so on for that year. That's the taxonomy that I chose. Given that ontology, you may have a completely different taxonomy. Okay. You might ask, if you look at a given system, why did the, why did the developers create that particular ontology rather than a different ontology? How did they go about the process of bringing into being a new set of conceptual structures. That has to do with the philosophical branch of epistemology. Where does new knowledge come from? When you're creating an ontology, you're creating something from nothing. Before there were operating systems, there were no virtual files or virtual folders. They created it. There's different kinds of ontologies they could have created. Remember our discussion about design philosophy? What's the best way to go about making something, turning human desire and need into a product? That has a lot to do with epistemology. OK, let's spend a minute just talk, thinking about ontologies. What is the ontology for the Leap Motion library? When you import Leap and start manipulating uh, the data structures in there, what is the ontology that exists in Leap Motion? It's not files and folders. Is it like how the hands are organized by fingers and bones? How the hands are, are fingers and bones, right? So there are two and there are two things that exist in Leap Motion: fingers and bones. What else are some items in the Leap Motion ontology? Yes. Hands, right? You got hands, fingers, and bones. Think about those three objects. How are they organized in the ontology? Bones are a subset of fingers, which are a subset of hands. Things are organized hierarchically, right? There's a nice. Uh, it turns out that the human skeleton or the mammalian skeleton is organized hierarchically, right? If you work from the center of the body out towards the tips, there's a very clear branching hierarchical structure which the developers of Leap Motion are exploiting, right? Brains tend to have it. It's easier for us to digest complex information if it's organized hierarchically. And hey, look, human anatomy is also organized hierarchically. 
makes perfect sense that you would start to create conceptual objects like hands and fingers and bones. What are some of the other abstract objects that make up the leap motion ontology? So there's those three that have to do with human anatomy. What else? Uh, you could say like the coordinate structure where the bones are found? Yeah, so the coordinate structure itself, right? The XYZ, the start XYZ and the end XYZ, the base and the tip, right? So obviously we're dealing with a geometric structure, so that's in there as well. That makes sense. There's also the controller and the frame, right? You can grab a controller from the thing called, uh, sorry, you can grab a frame from the thing called a controller, right? Frame and controller not really having anything to do with anatomy. The frame is drawing on a different uh, uh, metaphor. What is it? Cameras. Cameras, right, or video, right? You have something that's going in real time, which is actual physical movement in the real world, and you're capturing snapshots or frames, static pieces of information where you strip away time, right? Everything that's inside a frame is stuff from that point in, in time, right? It may seem obvious in retrospect, but imagine you went back to the beginning, I gave you a leap motion device and said, look, there's two infrared cameras in it, and you get pixel data. Go, make an ontology that will allow people to program and manipulate that, that information. Right? There's different ways you could do it, kind of makes sense. Okay. What are some other applications, some other technologies that have interesting ontologies? There's a vast majority of them that rely on files and folders. What else? What are some other applications that have very different ontologies? Well, the internet's organized into web pages and then pages for your web pages. Exactly, right? So you can now think about the ontology of the internet. They said, okay, look, there's going to be things called pages. And then it took a while to really refine this idea of a hyperlink, right? This link that points from one page to another. To us, it might seem blindingly obvious, but at the beginning, it wasn't so obvious, right? The starting point for the internet was the encyclopedia, right? A whole bunch of pages with text on them that captured as best they could all the information known to the human species, right? That was one of the guiding factors for the development of the internet. In the encyclopedia, there are no links that you touch on and point to another, another page. There's written text that says, if you'd like to learn more about this entry, you might also want to go look up dot, 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 right? So that led to this idea of clicking on text that had an underline and it would bring up another another page. Right? You can sort of see where the development of the ontology underneath the internet came from. What else? Uh, maps and countries and you, know, you have continents and then countries and then states and then towns. And then Very hierarchically organized, right? If you think about maps, a lot of maps will allow you to, to plunge through very large numbers of levels of hierarchy. So think about Google Maps, right? Again, it might seem obvious now. It's just part of what's on your phone. But what is the ontology underlying Google Maps? There is the hierarchy of the way that humans have or politically organized the world, continents, nation states, uh, states, counties, towns, neighborhoods, houses. What else aside from that? Leap Motion has hands and fingers and bones. Google Maps obviously has continents, countries, and towns, but what else? What other conceptual structures exist in Google Maps that are there because of what people are trying to do with Google Maps? Roads. Roads, okay. So like getting directions? Getting directions, right? So they're the sort of things that have an obvious counterpart in the real world. Remember our discussion about Edward Tufts' sec second book about pictures of nouns, right? You make a map which is a picture of roads and houses and countries and so on. But then there are additional things on top of Google Maps that don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence with a physical object, like the thing called a direction, right? Give me di or directions, plural. Tell me about that conceptual structure, directions in Google Maps. It itself is made up of other conceptual structures. Uh, Firstly, it can be sequential, so it's one direction after another. Or you could look at it as a root plotted 
on the map. Absolutely, right? So it's some, whatever that direction, that set of directions is, it's a set of sequences, right? And in some apps, it's actually <coughs> numbered. Step one, turn left. Step two, go 2.8 miles and make a right onto highway XYZ and so on, right? So there's some sequential organization there, which again, makes sense from a direction point of view. What else? The fact that they have different like, walking directions versus like, driving directions and like, biking directions. Absolutely, right? So we're going to take this conceptual object called directions and we're going to make different flavors of that conceptual object. Walking directions, driving, and biking. So now, in that exercise, we're starting to get into either coarse-graining or fine-graining our ontology. We're developing Google Maps. We're starting to sketch out what the basic conceptual objects are, but then things start to get tricky because then you start to say, well, do I want to have just few concepts and many different flavors of those concepts, or am I going to have lots of very different kinds of concepts? So what does a coarse-grained ontology looks, look like? Well, it's where you have very few categories and they're weakly typed. So going back to the example of the train station, we're going to create uh, a route, if you want. And a route has uh, four pieces of information, x, t1, y, and t2. A station leaves x at t1 and arrives at y at t2. That's it. We're going to keep things very, very simple. Um, on the other hand, we might say, well, wait a second. There's lots of different kinds of trains. People probably care about whether the train is going to stop at uh, Z, W, X, and Y uh, along the way? Are there lots of inter intermediate stations? What kind of train is it? Are we crossing national boundaries? Maybe that's something that's going to be important to the users. So let's instead create a fine-grained uh, ontology. We're going to create lots of different kinds of categories. Express trains, first-class trains, cargo trains, how many stops it makes. Is it a, car yeah, is it a cargo train? Is it for people? Uh, all sorts of things. So now we're starting to create these objects, we need to think about what sort of resolution are we creating things at. Okay, let's go back to the leap motion uh, example for a moment. Is that a coarse-grained or a fine-grained ontology? Are there many different kinds of very specific categories or conceptual objects in the leap motion API, or is there just a few? I would say there's a lot of them because there's different types of uh, uh, fingers and different bones in the fingers, and then it's just lots of different categories. Of the okay, you could argue that it's kind of a fine-grained uh, ontology because you actually can reference in that system the index finger and the middle finger, but you don't necessarily need to, right? What is this thing according to Leap Motion? It's what's that? It's zero. It's the zeroth finger, right? So they could have said, all right, these, we're going to treat these things as belonging to one category and this thing as a different category. And again, you can reference specifically the thumb, but they're, basically you can create a loop that loops over five things, right? That's very nice. It would, be a, it would be a bit of a pain if whenever you're creating software for leap motion, you had to loop over four things and then have a final fifth separate loop to deal with this thing separately, right? So in order to create a coarse grain, or at least at that level, to create a coarse grained ontology where they're going to collapse the thumb and fingers into one category, they had to hack things a little bit to make the thumb and the fingers fit together. So they had to deal with this sort of, this fact that all the things are not quite the same, a bit of a drawback there. How did the developers hack the system so that you can treat the thumb and the fingers as the same thing? Getting rid of one of the bones, pretty much. What, which actually is gone in the thumb, right? They're not getting rid of it. They're actually making one up that doesn't actually exist in the thumb. The thumb has one less major bone than the fingers, so they just put it in, and that line corresponding to that bone has zero length, right? By doing that, aha, now we can treat all of these as the same thing, right? So they're playing a little bit with the resolution of the ontology. Okay, so again, you, some people may not be aware that they're doing this, but as an HCI designer, if you're creating a brand new app or a brand new piece of technology where you're, in addition, creating a brand new ontology, it pays to think about these things carefully. If the lead motion developers had not thought about that and treated the thumb and finger separately, it would have been very clumsy to interact with their, their system, right? It matters. 
Okay, so we created coarse-grained uh, ontology. Big pro is it's relatively simple, right? There's few categories. In leap motion, there's one category, finger, rather than two categories, thumb and finger. And it's easy to classify objects. But then you have sort of vague category descriptions. You have complex objects where you have to add additional information or metadata. Complex objects in the sense that one of those five fingers has a zero length uh, line associated with it. You've got to sort of make everything fit. Fine-grained ontology is nice because you have very sharp category distinctions. There are thumbs and there are fingers. They're separate. And I can create a very clean representation of the thumb that doesn't have this clumsy additional uh, virtual bone. But you then have these many categories and it's hard to find the right category. Or if you're writing code, you have to treat each category differently. Pros and cons of how you choose a resolution or graining for your ontology. Okay, so we've seen this before. If you're creating an information space, sometimes you're creating the ontology itself, and other times the ontology is already set, and you're just creating a taxonomy uh, for it. Okay, we talked about epistemology already. Okay, so now let's take this idea of ontology. Let's imagine that we're creating a new, a completely new kind of virtual space. In order to make those decisions, we want to go back to our packed analysis, right? Or what are people going to do with the system, activities, context, and so on. And so we've listed here a bunch of characteristics that exist for the information space on which you're projecting an ontology. We might have uh, an information space that's volatile, meaning the things themselves are changing uh, all the time. Luckily for the leap motion developers, the anatomy of the human hand is probably not going to change anytime soon. So you can sort of set that in, in stone, right? That's not going to change too much. Can you think of examples of applications where the ontology itself changes over time? How about the Facebook like system? Okay, um, how so? Now there are multiple types of likes. There's like the heart, the smiley face, all these things you can react with on any type of post right before it's only. Yep, that's a good example, right? So they started with the coarse grain ontology, right? Facebook has this, and does it have this? I don't even know. This and not this, okay, right? And then they started to split it into a finer grain ontology. I don't know why, but they must have had a good reason, a good reason for it. You think about operating systems, right? I mentioned it has files and folders, but there are other uh, conceptual objects in an operating system that weren't there to begin with, like devices, right? So now your operating system may detect other devices that come within Wi-Fi or Bluetooth range of your machine, right? That's because the internet itself or the internet of things, if you like, is changing. So the underlying uh, ontology of operating systems has changed since it's since its beginning, right? And who knows, maybe it will change again as new technologies uh, appear. Okay, if it's volatile, however, we might wanna try and keep a coarse-grained ontology so we're not continuously creating new categories as the underlying system itself changes. Okay, uh, again, size, we kinda of just sort of talked about this, so depending on the resolution of your ontology, it influences, it affects what people are going to do with the underlying uh, information system. Most information systems you can think of, there's some sort of form of search, right? I wanna use Google to find something or I'm gonna use Google Maps and try and find the best route. I'm searching for something. So if I choose a coarse-grained uh, ontology, then people spend a lot of time searching within complex objects because we have just one category. If we have very fine-grained ontology, we have lots of different categories we have lots of different categories. We have relatively few objects inside of each category, and people are performing search across categories. So if you create a web page, you can in some way influence the ontology. I could create a website where I have few, very, very long pages, or I could create a website that has a lot of very small pages. And then if I have internal search within my website, it's going to influence how people search, right? So if I have few long pages, I'm doing sort of search or text search within the page for certain keywords. If I have lots of very small pages, 
It doesn't make sense to go to each page and do a text search. I want to have some way to search across all my, my categories. So the choice of size or the ontology itself influences search. We've mentioned that an information space is made up of all of these conceptual objects. We also have physical and perceptual objects. And I apologize, there's a typo here in the slides if you have a version of it. Conceptual objects is what we just talked about. They're the things that make up the ontology. Then you have physical objects, right? The things that the people are actually grabbing or touching or manipulating to influence the conceptual objects. And then we have the perceptual objects that are somewhere in between, right? They're a visual or auditory representation of an underlying conceptual object. And when I push things or it manipulate things, I'm trying to manipulate those perceptual objects. And one way of thinking about creating good visual or auditory metaphors is I'm trying to create a good match between conceptual objects and perceptual objects. Okay, I realize now that I read this again, it wasn't a typo. This should say, find a good match between physical and perceptual objects to the conceptual objects themselves. So we know what the conceptual objects are, files and folders, or hands and fingers and bones. We've made that decision as we're developing our system, what are we gonna show the user to give them a virtual representation of those things? Well, in Leap Motion, the perceptual objects are pretty clear, right? It's usually some form of a skeleton hand, right? Lines are perceptual objects that map one-to-one -one onto a finger, right? The conceptual object. Okay, and then what is the physical object? Well, that's the Leap Motion device uh, itself, or you could argue the hand, right? So a good match between a perceptual object like an icon and, uh, and a conceptual object like a file is to have different icons for different file types, right? That's an idea that's been around for a long time. There are different kinds of files. You might use a color coding, green for data files, red for apps, blue for whatever, video and, and images. Let's say your conceptual object is a tightly interconnected graph. You've got a data set which is made up of a bunch of nodes and all those mode nodes are attached together with edges. That's your conceptual object. You want to try and show that to the user. You usually draw some form of a network. It doesn't make sense to kind of store part of it in one file and show that file and store another part in another file and show that part. It's not a good match. If your underlying conceptual object is a network, you usually want to somehow draw that, that network. Kind of makes, makes sense. Okay. What is the topology inside your ontology? So topology is sort of the connectivity or the underlying structure of the thing. So not just what are the different categories, but how are they related to one another, right? So here are some conceptual objects, animal, human, rock, uh, and planet, and I could ask you for any given pair of these concepts, which pairs are closer to one another than others? Kind of makes sense, right? We would all sort of agree animals and humans are closer together than animal and planet. Maybe you could argue the other, but somehow we have an intuitive sense in that ontology of what is close to one another. We're obviously not talking about literally close, we're talking about semantically similar to one another. Okay. Once we start to understand how things are related to one another, then we can start to think about activities again. How do we move through that space, right? So we could ask about the topology of a website or the internet as a whole, right? What's, what's the structure? What's the structure of Wikipedia? There's an information space, all Wikipedia pages. The ontology is the same as any website. You've got a bunch of pages and a bunch of links. What's the topology there? A lot of like, kind of the categories are actually links themselves. So if they're using a concept that's within that page, it will be hyperlink to that. Excellent, right? So there are pages and links, yes. But if we get a little more detail, there are special pages which list all instances of a category, right? So if we think about the metaphor of a network, there, there are big nodes in Wikipedia, which is the category page. And that category page has links pointing into it from a whole bunch of pages which describe instances of that, that category. 
What else? What are some of the other, what are some of the other aspects of the topology of Wikipedia? We've actually changed the ontology now when we talk about Wikipedia. There, yes, there are pages and links, but there are also special pages, right? Like the category page. It's also like That's a great observation, right? So the vast majority of links in Wikipedia point to other Wikipedia pages, right? Now, whether the authors did that consciously or unconsciously, I don't know, but that's, that's a great observation, right? It's densely interconnected. And of course, there are lots of links emanating outward from Wikipedia to the rest of the internet and also vice versa, but inside the Wikipedia universe, it is very tightly connected. That's a great observation about its topology. Is there a central page? I mean, there's a front page, obviously, but a central page. You remember the React table? We had all these sources, and we had one central sink. I was telling you a few weeks ago about Wikipedia games. If you click on the first link in the main body text of a Wikipedia page, it'll take you to a new page. If you click on the first link in the main body text of that page, it'll take you to another page. You might assume that you would just go round and round at random, right? Wikipedia is just a ball of interconnected Wikipedia pages, but it is not. It, doesn't it converge on like philosophy? Converges on philosophy. So there is a central node in the structure of this ontology, which is the page about philosophy. Kind of interesting. You can go and play the game if you like and verify that. Yep. Well, so the philosophy page also has which points to? Uh, it, it, it doesn't to point to philosophy. But, but it, yeah. you end up getting stuck in a loop. I, I'm so sure. That philosophy is part of that loop. That's it. So it's actually not an individual page. There's an attractor. There's a set of central pages. Think about the, the big black hole at the center of the galaxy, right? All the things are drawn into this and circle around in a very short radius, right? So we're now engaging in a very detailed geometric discussion about an abstract thing, right? The Wikipedia universe. It has structure. There are things that are closer and further away. There are things that pull other things in towards them. Okay. So now we can go from even, even more detail and start to talk about distance and direction, right? You can click on links and go inward towards philosophy. But it's harder to go back out. You can, of course, by clicking links. But there is some sort of central tendency or direction in the Wikipedia universe. This is going to be important for you when you do your user testing. We touched on this last time. What does it mean for two things to be far apart in an ontology? Is it the number of links it takes to click to go from one to the other? If there are activities, if an activity is a conceptual object in your ontology, how long does it take to complete one activity and then the next activity? Maybe time uh, is important. So how would we actually go about measuring distance in uh, an ontology? In any part of the internet, it's easy. It's usually a number of clicks. What is the concept of distance in the leap motion ontology? There is one. Absolutely, right? So there's the anatomical distance, which is, or there's the anatomical structure which imposes a distance metric on the ontology. The tip of the distal phalange is far from the base of the proximal phalange, the base of your, your finger, right? But there is a separate distance system, which are the coordinate systems themselves, right? So I can bunch my finger, and now the tip of my finger is close to the base of my finger in one distance metric, which is the XYZ coordinates, but it's still far in the hierarchical organization of classes, right? If I wanted to march from one bone object to the next, it's still just as far. You actually have two separate distance metrics in the leap motion ontology. Okay, what does is, what is direction mean? Well, direction only makes sense if someone is navigating through the information space. Can navigation be reversed, for, for example? 
What are some of the visual analogies or metaphors that make sense for helping people understand distance and direction? If you have a branching topology, um, up is often clear and down is often not. What do I mean by that? Well, let's think of an example. Let's go back to web pages. You open your browser and you click on a few links. You click on link A, B, and then C. So you're now on web page C and you hit the back button or the up button on your browser. Which page do you go to? The previous one. The previous one, right? It's obvious. Up is usually obvious to the human brain in a hierarchy because there's only one thing above, right? A hierarchy is a set of branches, so if you're moving up, there's only one parent branch. Imagine now you're surfing and you go to page A, B, C, back to B, then forward to D. Now you hit the back button. You go to B. You hit the forward button on your browser. Where do you go? C or D, it's unanimous, D, Y. C and D are now both forward in this little trace you've done, A, B, C, B, D, B. C and D are both forward from B. There are links to C and D in page B and you visited both. Why is it obvious that you go to D? Exactly. There is an implicit assumption about time in the back, the backward and forward arrow in a web page, right? If you go backward and forward and then want to go forward again, the assumption is usually, for most people, for most P's and most A's, you usually want to go forward to the page you were just at, for whatever reason, right? You can look at traces of people navigating the internet, that tends to be the case. So it seems obvious to us that it would be D because implicitly you know that it's building in some assumption about time when it comes to direction. Okay. Okay, this is an HCI class, so let's talk a little bit about media and visual design. How do we bring all of these things, which are arguably very, very abstract things, how do we bring them to life, right? What sorts of sensor modalities are you, are you going to exploit in your new information space? Is it going to be purely a visual thing, an auditory thing? Uh, is everything going to be done statically? Are we going to try and communicate through video change over time? How do we convey to the users uh, a space's uh, structure? So we'll look at, an, in a, at a moment in a video of a particular interface that exploits some aspects of the human visual system very carefully to convey some information about the information space's structure. Okay. Hi, my name is Johnny Lee, and in this video I'm going to show you how to perform head tracking and create desktop virtual reality displays using the Nintendo Wii Remote. Now, first, what do I mean by a desktop VR display? Well, you think about most computer screens, they're typically used to display a flat image, a little bit like this picture in this picture frame. Even if the picture is of something 3D, uh, like a video game, the picture is still flat. So it doesn't change depending on what angle you view the screen at. A desktop VR display, however, is a little bit like taking the picture out of the picture frame and then just having the frame. Now the scene actually changes depending on what angle I view the screen at. So this essentially becomes a portal or a little window into another room. Now to do this, the computer needs to know the location of your head relative to the screen, and this is called head tracking. Now to perform head tracking, we're going to be using the Wii Remote and the sensor bar, but we're actually going to be using them backwards. We're going to put the Wii Remote next to the TV and actually move the sensor bar instead. The Wii Remote actually contains an infrared camera, and the sensor bar is simply two sources of infrared light. When the camera sees the two dots of light, it's going to give an approximate location of my head horizontally, vertically, and in distance from the screen. Okay, the tricky part is, now we're going to have to find some way to mount the sensor bar onto our head. One common trick is to get a baseball cap, and then mount the hardware to the cap. And this is definitely going to work, but it's a little bit goofy. So instead, 
Some hardware stores sell these safety glasses with LEDs built in on the side meant to be used as headlamps. Now if you replace the LEDs with infrared ones, you essentially get your head mounted sensor bar and a nice sporty safety goggle form factor. <laughs> Once we've created our head mounted sensor bar and I've connected my Wii Remote to my PC, we're ready to do some head tracking. Behind me is a demo program of a 3D room with some targets floating in it. Now because the effect only works for the person wearing the sensor bar, I'm going to have to show you the effect through a moving camera. Now to do this, I'm literally just going to hold the sensor bar at the base of the camera and move it around. Just a quick note, to power the sensor bar, I simply turn on my Wii after I've connected my Wii remote to my PC. First, I'm going to show you what it looks like without head tracking, which is what displays normally look like. You can see that although it's a picture of a 3D room, the image looks very two-dimensional and bound to the surface of the TV. Now with head tracking turned on, the TV actually looks like the entrance to a real room. Just like in real life, by moving our head around, we can look behind objects. And if you look really closely, some targets actually appear to be floating out in front of the screen, reaching into the real world. If we get closer to the screen, we get closer to the objects, and we can even get behind the ones floating in front of the screen. As I pull the camera back, keep an eye on the frontmost target. Head tracking provides the illusion that the target is actually floating directly above the laptop screen, far in front of the TV. Now using this picture of a football stadium, if you move right, you can see more of the field. If you move left, you can see more of the stands. And if you get closer to the screen, you see more of everything, just like a real window. If I use my IR glasses and keep the sensor bar on the TV, I can use a second Wii remote to point and shoot like any Wii game while also doing head tracking. So now ducking and shifting your body is actually meaningful to a game. You can also see now uh, how the perspective is incorrect if you are not the one wearing glasses. So head tracking for VR displays is only going to work for one person at a time. But for that one person, the 3D experience is going to be far more realistic and immersive than anything else we see in homes today. So if you're watching this and you're a Nintendo Wii game developer, I want to see some games. Anyway, as usual, you can visit my website. Okay. So Johnny Lee asked at the end if any, uh, if any Nintendo developers would actually adopt his technology and make some games. They did, and Johnny doesn't have to work ever again if he doesn't want to. Okay. How does this work? What aspects of the human visual system are being exploited to create the illusion of three dimensions here? Did it seem 3D to you? Did it work? Yeah. Okay. The intuition that um, larger and clearer objects are closer. Larger and obje uh, clearer objects are closer. That's true. But that's still a static description. It's not just the visual system, but the visual system combined with motion that makes this work. Is that parallax effect of things closer to you, uh, like moving across the screen faster than they further away? Exactly. He didn't mention it, but all of this is relying on the on parallax, right? So as I move up here at the front of the room, people sitting at the front, your head seem to be moving back and forth faster than students at the back of the room. Right? So the system is detecting uh, or is inferring the 3D position of the user's head and using, that 3D informa using those 3D coordinates to alter the motion of the targets. Right? So targets that are supposed to be further back in the screen, they move slower than objects that are closer, supposed to be closer or, as he said, out in front of the screen. What else? How does the world around you move when you move? So if you move right, things move left and vice versa. Everything moves in the opposite direction, right? That makes sense. As I move to my left, you, the whole world moves to my right. OK. You, you mentioned there that you have to actually be wearing this very uh, beautiful form factor glasses to get this to work. 
but you just watched the video and you weren't wearing the glasses and it worked. How is that possible? Right? Usually if you go and watch a 3D movie, you've got to wear those goofy 3D glasses. You're not wearing any glasses. Why did it look 3D to you? The, the screen is just a two-dimensional two projection of 3D, just like the camera. Okay, so the screen is a 2G, 2D projection, but that's true if you go see a 3D movie. There's still a 2D screen. Why did your brain tell you that those targets were in three-dimensional space? when he held the camera on the bar. What was happening there? Because of the way that they were reacting to, to motion, reacting to the world. Okay. Towards the end, you also saw him actually playing the game, and his head was moving, and the, and the objects were moving in opposition. But in that short frame, you go back and watch it, they don't look 3D. So at some points in the video, it does and doesn't look 3D. What's the difference? We're about to start our discussion of cognitive psychology and mental models, which will give you a strong hint. It's because of our perspective on the Right, so it's a little complicated, right? Because he's got a system which is providing a 2D view on a 3D space. You're watching a video of that system in play. Your brain is telling you in the first person view when he's holding the camera on the bar and moving it, you're seeing first-person perspective. Your brain is telling you that you're wearing the camera on your, you're wearing the bar on your head and you're moving, right? You're not, you're sitting quietly, but your brain is ignoring that fact and saying, okay, I see a first-person perspective, I'm moving. And I'm moving and everything else is moving in opposition in exactly the way that my mental model says 3D objects should move when I'm moving, right? When I move up here at the front of the room, everything I see is corroborating my mental model, right? If student heads at the back of the room were moving more than ones at the front, I'd first of all feel very nauseous and very surprised and something's very wrong, right? So it works here. Your brain says, there's all this evidence that matches up. These are 3D objects. I see 3D objects. When you saw Johnny playing the game and he's wearing, he's wearing the sensor bar, the video is not moving, right? The, the YouTube video is not moving. He's moving. So from his point of view, it, you see 3D, but your brain says, this is not a first person perspective. This is third person. I'm watching someone else play the, the game. The illusion collapses and you see 2D. Right? Okay, again, uh, kind of an interesting example because it's very carefully exploiting different kinds of media, different, uh, in this case a visual sense, and also exploiting a very important part of human psychology, right? the visual system, the predictive part. If I see the world moving around me in, in a certain way, that means I'm moving, even if I can't feel that I'm moving. Okay. Design, we want to try and give our space a coherent design. This can be obvious things like having a, uh, a uniform color system throughout uh, your your conceptual space, but it might, might also be coherent conceptual design. We want to have the same sort of concepts throughout a system. If we're relying on a visual analogy or metaphor that small objects tend to be distant objects, we want to preserve that metaphor in different parts of, of the system. Okay, simple and consistent color schemes. We might repeat topological Pattern. So if we're creating a website with lots of very small pages, people start to figure that out and that makes sense. If suddenly there's very, very long pages, it doesn't fit into the topology of the, the system. Okay, let's finish with uh, agents here. So in a lot of complex uh, information spaces, they also become infested with agents. So now we have not just users navigating the internet, but bots as well. Some of them are working on our behalf. Some of them may be working against, uh, against us, but they have their own perceptual movement and cognitive abilities. A bot that's trolling the net has its own particular view onto an information space, the internet, which is different from a human observing the internet through, through a browser. Okay. They may be bots that are working on behalf of humans. If we're in a virtual reality, they may be avatars or non-human AI agents. What do agents do? Well, hopefully they're trying to move through a space 
and clean it up or organize it for us in, in some way, right? So bots on Wikipedia may go through and find dead links and either delete them or notify users uh, that they're there. They're doing something to help us navigate through that space. A librarian bot may organize data into easy to recognize categories. So there are library bots in Wikipedia that troll through the pages and add category labels or put everything into a more or less consistent design for Wikipedia uh, pages. There's also great examples of virtual ants. So ants are amazing creatures. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left, so let's end with ants. So uh, a lot of ants exist in environments where there are very long distances between their nest, like you see here, and various food sources in their environment. Uh, ants as a whole will very quickly figure out the shortest path from their nest to a given food source. How do they do that? They're very small creatures. They don't have Google Maps. They can't stand on the top of the food pile and look back towards their nest and do dead reckoning to figure out how to get back. From the point of view of an individual ant, it is exceedingly difficult to determine the shortest path between food sources and nests. Nature discovered this fantastic pack, which is allow certain insects to leave chemical traces in their environment as they move, and those chemical traces evaporate over time. Could be a few seconds, could be a few minutes. At the outset, ants may be moving randomly and leaving a trail behind them. They also have an instinct that if they smell a pheromone in front of them, to follow it. That's about it. So how does that lead to shortest paths? Walk at random. And if you find some food, grab the food. And also, if you smell pheromone, follow it. Walk along the path of the pheromone. How does that end up creating shortest paths between food sources and the nest? It's a beautiful algorithm. Well, the, the shorter path means that it's more, you can travel along faster, and so the, the more pheromones are still in the air, when it doesn't have to be Absolutely. So if I'm a random ant walking around leaving pheromone, and I find a distant food source, I might turn around and follow my own pheromone trail, but it's a very long trail, so a lot of it dissipates, and I might then, even halfway back to the nest, start to walk randomly again. A different ant may have, by walking randomly, discovered a closer food source, done exactly the same thing, picked up a piece of food, turned around, and walked back. Because it's a shorter path, there's more pheromone, you're more likely to get back to your nest. And oh, by the way, as you are, you're dropping more pheromones. So a third ant who's leaving the nest is much more likely to follow your trail than they are to follow my trail, which is already dissipated. And after a while, you have highways of pheromone linking food sources, close food sources back to the nest. This algorithm is actually used by telecommunications companies. So if you look at packets moving along uh, the internet or any uh, telecommunications network, sometimes certain links get clogged, get clogged, and packets, which are dropping virtual pheromone, are plugged and it takes them longer to get somewhere. And that virtual pheromone dissipates virtually. But packets that move relatively quickly between different points in the network are leaving a lot of virtual pheromone. And another packet that's trying to get from point A along some path to point B will follow the path that has greatest virtual pheromone. That simple algorithm is used by a lot of bots and agents that try and update in real time paths in a, in a network. Does anybody know the Waze app? Real-time traffic uses a similar concept. Okay, I think that's a good place to end. You have a quiz due tonight, and we'll talk about deliverable six next Tuesday. See you then.